understand.
in my life. We put a representation of our father in all of our movies. I prayed for me and my brother and my mom to get through this night. I think we lived in seven different houses, kind of running from my dad. I started losing my ability to walk. We didn't realize the war that was going on inside of him. Wishing that I could just die. Lord, why didn't you give me a dad I could call? Because I need wisdom right now. I knew that I wasn't prepared to be anybody's mom. I was doing the right thing for him. I panicked, and Sherman says, man, listen, calm down. It is a beautiful thing to have a child. This is why I do what I do. For guys like that. I mean, it was like the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. He said, I can tell that you already love her. And I did. I would get asked about family history. I didn't have any answers because I didn't know. Did you have a baby in 1972 in Allegheny County? She sends back, yes. Um, as is her. I'm stunned. He's real. He's really out there. And this is really him. This is really him. In the Bible, the blessing is everything. I declare that you are a beloved son in whom we are well pleased. You're pushing all the buttons that men want to hear their dad say. It was the first time I had been called out like that. He was that first man that paid attention to me. He was treating me like a dad would. Your perfect father in heaven can change the trajectory of your life. It's like the light came through, and I wept till I couldn't weep anymore. been a good father i need somebody to show me amen welcome to cave spring baptist church if uh uh, if you're wondering why we showed that trailer, it's because um, that movie came out this weekend. Um, if those of you that are familiar with the Kendrick brothers, they did movies like Courageous and Fireproof. And, um, and so uh, we're going to be uh, going to see that movie today. Um, I say we because all of you are invited to do that. Um, the movie will be at uh, 2.15 at the Decatur uh, AMC Cinemas there in the mall. Um, your entrance to that movie will be free. Uh, it, it won't cost you anything for a ticket. If you want to do concessions or whatever, those are on your own um, because we don't want to take a second mortgage out to pay for that. And so, uh, but uh, no, just kidding. But I believe um, wholeheartedly that, that there is a war against the family. There is a war against particularly fathers um, and that um, this movie will help uh, our church, this, uh, our, our society, the church, locally, but also the church as a whole. And, and so, um, again, you are invited to come see that movie. If you uh, would like to do that, um, you can meet us at the, um, it's kind of meet us in the lobby of the movie theater there at 145. At 145 in Decatur, I'll get a head count, and I will get your tickets for you. Um, and then, again, concessions would be on your own, uh, but then we'll go watch the movie. The movie begins at 215. If you show up at 215, um, that's great. I'm probably not going to be out there to buy your ticket, though. So um, feel free to come in and do that if you want to. But uh, if you'll just uh, come and meet us there, that would be great. Again, uh, Show Me the Father movie, uh, 145 today. We're meeting at the AMC Theaters in Decatur. Um, 215, the movie begins. The cost of the movie is free for you. Um, I will say this. The movie is, it's not a movie in the sense of, like, if you're thinking of, like, courageous or... A fireproof or anything like that. Um, it's it's a documentary, okay. So if you have smaller children, younger children, and and the the themes that are dealt with in the movie are, um, I mean it's it's a PG movie, but there are PG themes. And so um, if you have a child like uh, my younger two children will not be going. Um, I don't know that they would want to sit through a documentary. So um, if you have younger children, um, you know. That's your decision to make. I'm not going to stand there at the door and tell them they can come in or can, can't come in. Um, but um, you make a decision as a parent to decide whether you're going to whether your child uh, whether this movie is appropriate for your child or not. And then um, 
and then you bring all and come on. Does that make sense? Everybody nod like you understand what I'm saying. Okay, great. Uh, welcome to Cave Spring. That being said, uh, if you are a visitor here today, you are our special and honored guest. Thank you for choosing Cave Spring to worship with this morning. If you, should, if you can look in front of you, there should be a card. This is Connect on it. If you'll take that card and fill it out and place it in one of our offering boxes um, at each exit. Uh, that is your gift to us. We really appreciate those. If you want to go a step further um, and take those uh, welcome cards uh, to our, our welcome desk, uh, there will be somebody standing there uh, at the end of service that is directly right out this center aisle to my right, your left, depending on which side of your, uh, uh, which side of the sanctuary here you're sitting on. But right out here at the middle, there'll be somebody standing out there, and they will give you a gift. And that gift will be uh, like a coffee mug or a tumbler, and it'll be filled with candy. And again, that is just a way for us to show you that uh, we appreciate you coming um, and, and giving us uh, and making a, a record of your visit. Um, we got tons and tons and tons of stuff going on. This is an exciting fall season of, uh, to be at Cave Spring. We've got homecoming week at Priceville High School, right? Yeah. No? Is it? No? Wait, next week. Next week is homecoming week. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Homecoming week is next week. The parade is coming through next week. I'm sorry. I'll address that next week. We have candy bins over here off to, off to my left, your right, uh, for our glow night, if you can make some donations for that. Um, we have a missions team meeting. If you're on the 518 missions team um, and can be here up in the youth room for a brief meeting, we want to talk about uh, Operation Christmas Child, which is also coming up, our shoe boxes and things like that. Um, that's coming up. And so uh, the Senior Saints tomorrow, if you are a Senior Saint, uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in our fellowship hall, you guys are having lunch, um, and uh, they've asked you to bring a dish to share with everybody, so if you could have that, that would be great, um, and I believe that's it. Stand with me this morning, um, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this time that we can come together. God, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for uh, the ability to come here in this free country uh, and worship you, uh, God, I pray that we don't take this time for granted, but God, also just like we discussed this morning in our small group time, uh, in a way to fireproof our church, really, as individuals, the responsibility falls on us. It falls on us to search your scriptures. It falls on us to put on your armor. It falls on us to... stand in the gap and to defend our brothers and sisters in Christ, to defend our church, to defend our families, to defend your word. God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, continue speaking to us this morning, so that we may grow, we may become more like your son, Jesus Christ, so that we can Share the, the, your love and your grace and your forgiveness with a, with a lost and dying world. God, thank you for Jesus who makes this all possible. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
I was not trying to impress God. I was trying to impress the world. And we all go through struggles, big or small. And we just tell ourselves, just don't let the world see what we're going through. Don't let them know that we're going through something. Because you don't want people to look at you differently for struggling. And um, Josh always says, no one will lie to you like you will lie to yourself. And that is the like best, I wouldn't say advice, but it's so true. And it's we go through struggles and we tell ourselves that they're so little that why would we give them to God? Because everyone else is going through struggles and he gets struggles that are so big, it makes ours seem so small. And so we tell ourselves it's not worth giving to God because it's so small that we can take care of it ourselves because we are in control. And um, it's not true. He wants all of us. He wants all of our struggles. And he doesn't want us to go through anything alone. So with that being said, um, whatever you're going through, don't lie to yourself and say that it's too small to lay down. But I, I'm, I'm encouraging you to lay it down. And don't go back and pick it up. Because that's what we do. We lay it down and then we go back when everything is fine and we pick it back up because we just can't 
not be in control. Um, so lay it down and don't pick it up and worship God. With this next song, it's our last song. And if you've just gone through the motions and just treated these songs as routine, with this song, just worship because God deserves it all. He deserves everything. He deserves our worship. So just lay it down and worship God. Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Rise within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Set me deep In a mercy kids you can be dismissed and children's church over here to your left jam kids to your right guys thank you so much students filling in uh, Jim and Sarita they're out of town this week at a wedding 
And so the students, what a blessing it is to have them here leading us in worship. And, oh, excuse me. Katie Beth going vulnerable on us and telling us her story and it just making the worship all the better for us. And, and, and uh, Exactly right. That's exactly right. So, man, it was awesome stuff. Well, who's excited that uh, football season? I'm talking college football. Anybody? Anybody excited that college football season has started? Some of us. If you're an SEC fan, you're, you're happy about it. I mean, they're, they're, doing, they're doing spectacularly. I mean, Auburn uh, undefeated. Any, any Auburn fans? All right. Alabama, obviously undefeated. South Carolina Gamecocks, barely undefeated. We are undefeated. Um, how about this one? Arkansas Razorbacks, undefeated. <laughs> Did y'all check that game? So Texas Longhorns thinks they're going to join the SEC, and, and, and Arkansas is like, let me show you what it's like when you get here. And so I, I, liked, I liked what happened uh, the other day. Clemson, not undefeated. Oh, Clemson's not undefeated. They, they lost their first game to an SEC last week to Georgia. Um, but I'll tell you this, uh, anybody go to the games? Anybody go to the live action games and you're sitting in the packed uh, stadiums? I mean, I, I do. I mean, I, it's been a while, but I've been to Williams, Bryce, and Columbia for the Gamecocks. I've been to Clemson Memorial Stadium. And I'm going to go, hopefully, down the road to, you know, to, to Auburn and, and Alabama games just to check out the SEC action here. But I'll tell you this, when you go to those games, you, you really don't get to know the the folk, I mean, unless you've got season tickets, and I used to have them, or my, my parents did when I was younger, and we got to know those in the crowd around us, because we'd see them all the time when you have those tickets, but typically, when you go, and you, and you don't have season tickets, you go to the games, and even though you're all on the same page, and you're shouting, and you're cheering your team, and you've got that camaraderie, you really don't know the folks necessarily around you, I mean, you got thousands around you. You're not going to call any of them up the next day when you're in a pit and you need some prayer and you need some help, or you're not going to call anybody up the next week and say, let's hang out, because you, you were shouting in full vigor with them. But you really don't know them. I mean, you, you're, not, you're not making that connection at the games in that way, right? In the same way, if you're just coming to the 1015 service here, you might get to, I mean, if you sit at the same place all the time, you got your own season tickets here, you're sitting in the same spot, and if others sit around you typically, you might, you might get to know some of those folks coming in and coming out, and you see some folks, and you sit in the same spot. But, but I'll tell you, if this is the only connection you got going on here with this family, then you're missing out. You're not going to get to know truly the folks of the church unless you take that next step, unless you go the extra mile. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to, to take some next steps. we got some, some ways you can connect with family, church family here. You can connect in large and small ways. Let's talk about large groups. Let's say, you know, this is, this is the largest of groups. We have our corporate worship here. That, and some of us are joining online. Some of us are in the, in the house this morning. Corporately, we're together. But take a, take a, a step down to a, another group, not as large as this one, and, and you can join. we got, you know, kids ministry happening now youth have Wednesday night thing and you got men's ministry and women's ministry and senior saints are meeting tomorrow 55 and up for, for lunch and so we got groups that you can plug into and you can get involved and, and make some connections and then we got even smaller groups and, and that's when it really gets cool that's when it really you really get to connect and, and grow and know people and our small groups on Sunday mornings at least at, at 9 o'clock you can be in a group of you know our, our goal is not to let them get past 15, 16, 17 folks you know, uh, and so you can you can plug in and and pray for one another in those groups and really get to know one another and, and share concerns and discuss the word together in those small groups. So that's that's some cool stuff. And then we got fellowships, and, and with the fellowships, we've got small group fellowship. We got our large group and small group fellowships. And our large group fellowships, we do this on Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, you can join us in the fellowship hall, and you're going to be sitting family style on these long tables. You're going to invariably know and get to know the folks you're sitting with, who you're talking with and eating alongside of. You can join us on some Wednesday night fellowships. Every now and then on Sundays, we do some potlucks, and, and the whole church is invited to come over there and, and, and fellowship together. But then we have small group fellowships. If you really want to get to know a handful of people in the church, then we got what we call table talk, and you can sign up for that, and randomly, like, you know, you have nothing to do with it, you're going to get paired, right, you're going to get connected, right, Jennifer, with, with a handful of other, you know, a couple of other couples in the church, 
And you've got kids, some of them may have kids, doesn't matter, you all get together and, and you, you go out to eat or you go to one another's homes, you plan and decide what you're going to do over the next quarter where you really get plugged in and you get to know. And, and I'll tell you this, uh, Amy and I have loved getting together with our table talk groups over the, the series of time that we've done this. And we do more than that. We, we, we try to get together with a host of y'all just whenever. Sometimes I'll be calling you the day of and saying, hey, can you go out and eat tonight? Forgive me for that. Uh, but some of you have taken me up on it and we've gone out and eat with some of y'all and we just get to know Y'all, and so there's there's ways you can you can you can connect. You don't have to feel like you're going to a ball game when you come here at ten fifteen. This is the Super Bowl for us. This is the main event. This is what God's word points to that we come together once a week at least on Sundays. And so the ten fifteen chorus of us, all of us corralling together. This is this is it. But but don't let that be where you're trying to make your connections happen. Take the next step. If if this is it for you, then I challenge you to take the next steps and, and and watch God, you know, grow you with others. It says Acts 2 42, they were devoted to the apostles teaching for them. That was the word of God then because it hadn't been written. They were devoted to the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, and they were devoted to fellowship. They grew with one another in groups. So take the next step. Don't just come on 10, 15 Sundays and then walk out of here thinking, well, you've done your, your spiritual duty for the week. You can pat yourself on the back. Hey, I've, I've been to church. You've been to church, but you've not been the church. You've not connected with church family, per se. Um, so I challenge you. Man, I challenge you to do it. And if you do, do it. Uh, you won't regret it. You'll be like, man, I'm so glad I took that challenge from Pastor Brandon and started taking the next steps. Well, we're talking about the Boston Fire. Trey, go ahead and put that picture up there. Um, we, we launched this series, Fireproof Your Church, last week. And when the great Boston Fire of 1872 was raging and leveling much of Boston, uh, especially Boston's financial district, many Bostonians naturally had one thing on their minds, and that was saving their stuff. Boston was largely a very rich city, and Bostonians were very proud, very materialistic. It reminds me of the church Laodicea. You know, money and possessions meant the world to many. Bostonians, And so while the fire was raging, while it was destroying not quite 800 buildings over the course of 12 hours, largely through the night that Friday night, many were on a mad rampage to save and protect their valuables. Obviously, I mean, that's a given, right? Some of the stories from eyewitnesses, like Colonel Russell Herman Conwell, who wrote the history of the Great Fire in Boston, in the weeks after the fire. Some of the stories are maddening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they're wild. I'm going to re, um, recount some of them to you. Let me just tell you, I, I, did, I, I dived deep and did so many years ago when I was preparing to write the book. Um, I read many, many books about the Boston Fire, and this one is key. History of the Great Fire in Boston, written by an eyewitness who was on the scene. He wrote this in the days. He just started penning this book in the days after the fact about his his own eyewitness experiences. And this guy, this guy, Russell Herman Conwell, a lawyer, historian, author of, of many books. You, you may know him from other books. Um, not, this is the, one of the least of his books. Uh, but he became later in his life a, a Baptist pastor. I just learned that a couple of days ago. But I devoured this book and learned so much about what happened during the time of the fire. And so listen to this. Families whose homes were threatened, began moving items to public circles like Fort Hill in downtown Boston. They were moving their items away from the fire. Nothing was too trivial to be saved, to, 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 to be spared from the fire. I mean, eyewitnesses would see families moving furniture pieces and even plants. They were bringing plants out of their homes and, and, and piling it up to get it away from the fire. Makeshift tents were fashioned out of blankets and furniture. And some would try to sleep through the night as the fire was raging, especially children, while others would stand guard, uh, you know, to, to you know, keep, try to keep the looters away from coming and taking their stuff. And so business owners rushed to their stores and offices when the fire was happening and creeping toward their store or their particular office. They would try to get there to, to try to, you know, to, to get to their safes and to get to their important documents. And so millions of dollars uh, were in the city's safes. Some folks were so frantic that they couldn't think straight. And so one man 
one businessman made it safely to his office and got to his safe and the fire was encroaching right next door and he took his key out of the safe and he unlocked it and he pulled this wad of money out put it on the counter and then he pocketed his key and left and he got miles from the fire and pulled out what he hoped to be that wad of money but it was the safe key i mean he just he, he wasn't thinking correctly man it was it was crazy one man found a buggy a carriage with no horse you'll read in the book there was it was an episodic they had no horses at the time all the horses uh were sick um because they, they weren't wearing masks or vaccinated so they were they were all sick right <laughs> just, just just kidding just kidding all the horses were sick and not a one was on the fire force not a one was being used uh, by, by regular folks and so this guy found this just an empty carriage there outside of his store he filled it with money and papers and documents and store items he, he put as much store items as he could and then he with his own labor with his own strength pulled this carriage that normally a horse would pull several miles away from the office that was about to be consumed by fires many whose homes and businesses were not threatened by fire made collecting spoils and memorabilia artifacts of the fire they made that their mission they were going to go around and just garner whatever they could and they, looting was rampant there's a chapter about this you'll read about it if you haven't got there already that looting looting happened even by some trusted firefighters decided to to loot uh, people stole from businesses they stole from churches they stole from homes. Some were brazen enough to steal right out from under those guarding their things in public squares. They used a, a tragedy, this tragic crisis for their own selfish and personal gain. And so sometimes, and you know this, sometimes people can be very materialistic, can be a selfish bunch, you know, allowing the accumulation of money and of valuables and possessions to be their truest desire. The only thing on their minds in good times and in bad times, that's what's on their minds. And so sadly, too many folks today act like selfish Bostonians in this way. Are you one of them? Don't raise your hand, obviously. Are you one who's constantly thinking about your wealth and your possessions and your desires? Is acquiring more and more things, money, possessions, your nest egg, toys, stuff, is that your truest desire? Does it trump everything else? Is your bank account what matters the most to you? Are pay raises and investments and, and retirement funds and market cycles your bread and butter? Is that where you hang your hat? Are these things most important to you? Well, Jesus spoke to this, and I want you to, to read along with me in Luke 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 34. And this is called the parable of the rich fool. And we're going to pick this up where Jesus had been just teaching his disciples about various things. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13, says, Someone in the crowd, someone in the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, so you got someone in the crowd recognized the rabbi, Jesus, and they're going to interrupt him teaching his students, teaching his disciples. They're going to interrupt him for their own purposes, you're about to see. Someone in the crowd interrupts Jesus and says to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So this particular fellow probably wanted Jesus to weigh in on his personal dispute, probably with his older brother, because in Jewish code... Uh, it sounds like there's probably two brothers in this scenario. And so in Jewish code, the older brother got double the inheritance than the younger brother. You would always take however many sons you had and add one to it, and then that, that, that the older son gets the double portion. And so if you've got two brothers, the, the older son gets two-thirds of the estate. If you've got five brothers, that, that fifth son gets, you know, you know, the oldest son gets his plus another. And then, I mean, so he's always double the younger brothers. And so let's say there were there are probably two brothers and you've got this one brother, the, the younger brother, no doubt, perhaps here, who, who, who's wanting his fair share. I mean, he's, he's upset perhaps that his older brother got double, again, toward, uh, with, with, with Jewish code. He got double the, the inheritance. And he's, oh, this isn't fair. Jesus, Rabbi, hey, let's, let's let you weigh in on this. He was more consumed with money, this young fellow. He's more consumed with his inheritance. He's more consumed with advancing his politics over Jewish custom and Jewish tradition and Jewish codes. He was more consumed with this than he was maybe his own father's recent passing. 
because he's trying to get this rabbi, Jesus. That's all he is to this man. Jesus was just a teacher. Hey, I'm going to get this teacher to weigh in on this political situation, this money situation. Verse 14, but Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And see, while Jesus is the Lord of all, all things are created through him and for him. He could weigh in on anything and be within his rights. He's Lord of all. He nevertheless refused in this moment to let secondary matters hinder him from his mission. He's not going to weigh in on the nitty-gritty of this financial dispute. He wasn't going to weigh in on the politics and the legalities between two brothers, not because he didn't care about them as people. He did care, and he would speak to the heart of the one wanting more, more, more. Teacher, tell my brother to give me the equivalent of my half of the inheritance, and, and, and Jesus isn't going to go there. Look what he does do in verse 15. He said to them, take care. And that word take care, it means watch out. It means take inventory of yourself. An old term, check yourself, is what Jesus is saying. He's like, he's like survey yourself, dude. Here you are asking, you, you interrupted me and my disciples as I'm teaching, and you want me to weigh in on this financial matter. He's like, you better check yourself and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He says, real life is not about your stuff. That's not where it's out. Check yourself because you, you off on the wrong path. Possessions and money, Jesus would say here. He, what, he, what he's alluding to here is he's saying that these are just frills. And you know what frills are? They're icing on the cake. Or a frill can be a small piece sewn into a larger garment. It's something that's extra. And, and so you know this, cakes are good. Cakes are good with icing. I know it, believe me, I know it. But when, when there's a really great cake, it doesn't need icing. You don't even need the frills. And Jesus is trying to teach this, this intruder, this guy who interrupted his teaching, he's trying to speak into his life and say, dude, listen, life is more than stuff. It's more than frills. It's more than the money that you say you need that from, from your inheritance. It's more than the icing on the cake. He says, life consists, it does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Verse 16, and he told them, a parent them must be this dude and his brother, and then the disciples are with him. He told them all a like parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I know, I'll, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So now guess what you can do, soul? You can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So this, this guy in the parable was intending to be happy and satisfied because of his accumulation of stuff. That was all that was important to him in this, in this parable, this rich fool. But God said to him, fool. This, and by the way, fool, when you read it in the Proverbs and when you hear God calling somebody fool, fool means somebody who is going off. It always means somebody who's selfishly going off on their way rather than the correct way. And God says to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. In other words, this, this, today's the day you've been God-ordained to perish. You're going to die today, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure and this word's talking about earthly treasure, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so what does it mean to be rich toward God? It means to make him your treasure. We, we, just, we just sang about it. I mean, these, these songs were so apropos. And that third song about he wants our heart, he wants to be it. Everything in life should be about him about Christ we should be consumed with him that's what it means to be rich toward God to make him your treasure being consumed by and, and with him above all else and so possessions and wealth taking a back seat to him and his purposes and glory regarding your devotion to him and so Jesus went on to explain a little bit more about this about letting him be your treasure look at verse 22 and he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, 
nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? So here's a quick disclaimer. It's appropriate to work hard and to plan and to save. I want you to hear this. The Bible is full of instructions about these things. That, that we as humans, we're not birds, we as humans work hard and plan and, 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 and take care of ourselves and our families. It's what God's Word tells us to do. And takes care of one another in the house of God. If we're Christ followers, that's, that's what we are to do. So with that disclaimer notwithstanding, it, it, you know, we should nevertheless not be worrying or fretting over the more trivial aspects of life. And that's what Jesus is saying here worrying and toiling and, and, and you know going on and on about what you you know the clothes and the food and your shelter and are you gonna have enough money in the bank these are secondary because the larger point is, is that these things shouldn't be our main focus the larger point is that he is or or he should be we should reserve our focus for him more than these things katie beth came up here and said that she was focused on some trivial things that were important to her, they're important to all of us, how we appear and look before others. But, but, but th th then she had a paradigm shift. God reminded her, the Holy Spirit said to her, hey, don't focus on that. You're, you're going to worship me. And so even when it comes to money and, 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 and things that are important and, and the clothes we wear and the money we have and the bank accounts and the jobs we have, God's saying, and Jesus was saying here as he taught, he's saying these are, these are trivial things. I mean, don't fret over these. Look at verse 25. And which of you, by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life. If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, back then they would take grass, even flowers, and use it as kindling. He's like, if, if, if God's going to take care of even the grass... How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? In other words, O oh, you who are consumed with yourself, with your needs, acquiring your wealth. O oh, you who are considering, you know, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, per se. Your faith and your focus is on you. Your faith isn't so much on him. Your focus certainly isn't on him. That's what he's saying here. O oh, you of little faith, you've taken your sights from, from where it belongs and put it on you and your circumstances. Verse 29, he says, And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Here's the key. Look at verse 31. Instead, seek His kingdom. Instead, seek His kingdom. And these things, trivial things, the frills of life, the things that are important and, and, and they're necessary to survive, but they're still far secondary to Him. He says, seek Him first. Seek His kingdom. And then these things will be added to you. They'll be like in the background. They're going to take their course, but they won't be what you're focused on because you're focused on Him. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions then. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. In other words, you don't have to hoard. Christ follower, you don't have to hoard and you don't have to stockpile. Now again, Dave Ramsey's saving, which I'm a fan of, that's one thing. But we're talking about unnecessarily and, and, and worry and fret hoarding and stockpiling. He's saying, you don't have to do that, Christ follower. You can actually give to the needy knowing that your Father's going to take care of you. You are at liberty to give unto others in need when He, rather than wealth and possessions, is your focus. He says, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. So in other words, when you invest into others and meet their needs, you're doing the Lord's work because you're focused on Him. You're not consumed with merely investing in yourself and, and, and putting, you know, increasing your nest egg and hoarding and stockpiling. You're investing in, in, in God's directing. You're investing into the Lord's work. You're giving, you're handing over stuff to others at God's direction, and you thereby sow into His kingdom. 
where it won't be destroyed. He's saying that's, that's of most importance, putting him first and letting him lead. And so you hear of Christ followers, and maybe you're one of these, you hear of Christ followers who have the audacity to give somebody their car. It's happened to people in this church. You've either, either been the giver or on the receiving end. You've heard of Christ followers writing big checks to cover a need, selling property or, or stuff to invest in God's kingdom. You know why they do this? Because they're consumed with Christ. They're not consumed with themselves and their financial means and their nest egg. They're consumed with Christ. And so like the early church, the early church we learn of in Acts, they sold property and they gave to anyone in the church who had need. Why? Because they were following after him. He was, Christ was their focus. He was their sole motivator. They were consumed by him. He was their treasure. And so they could easily drop some land, drop some money, you know, sell the land off and, and drop some money at the apostles' feet and say, you use this for the needs of those in the church. I love the fact that it wasn't socialism. It wasn't forced. Big government didn't come down on these early Christians and say, you give this amount of money to so-and-so. No, no, no. It was all from their hearts. They, their expressions naturally flowed from those consumed with something better, someone greater than themselves greater than their nest egg. And so from the heart of them, from the heart of them being focused on Christ, they willingly of their own accord gave to those who had need. And this is the kind of, of giving. This is when we have him as our treasure. This is the treasure that will not be destroyed. Look at verse 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's what Jesus wants from each of us. We sang about it a moment ago, about our hearts belonging to him. That's what he wants from, from me. That's what he wants from you if you belong to him. He wants your heart. He wants to be your treasure. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. He wants to be it. He wants to be what you're constantly thinking about and what your heart is set on, not your finances or anything else. He was saying this to the, 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 the one worried brother who was worried over inheritances. He was saying, in essence, stop spending your faculties on what doesn't matter and realign your focus and your drive altogether. Look nowhere and to no one but me is what he was saying, not only to that individual, but to those around him. And he's saying that to us this morning. Look to me. Make me, says Christ. He says, make me your treasure. And so this is something that only God can desire and demand without it being arrogant or improper of him. Any of us to say, look to me, let me be your it, would be in, in the wrong terribly. But only God, there's, there's, there is no treasure aside from him. He is it. Only he can appropriately do it. It would be inappropriate or heretical of our God not to demand or desire our unadulterated attention. He is God, the holy and righteous creator of all things, the only one, as we sang about moments ago, again, every song was like it was handpicked for this message. He's the only one worthy of worship, and he's the only one worthy of our utmost devotion. So he is do it, and he wants to be our treasure. I'm reminded of a Netflix show that you may have seen along with me, uh, The Crown. Anybody saw The Crown? Are you watching any of it? That's one that you start watching that, you're going to binge watch that one. Uh, it's, it's, you know, loosely based on true stories of Queen Elizabeth, her rise and her lifestyle, her life, if you will. Um, I'm reminded of a particular scene in that, in that show. Um, I, you know, Queen Elizabeth has j just recently been coronated as queen when her father sadly passed, and she was a young queen, and she's in this room looking at The, the Crown, and so she wants to just go and put it on her head to see kind of, because it's weighty, you know, it's big, and she wants to see how it feels. And so she's asking, she, she looks around at, at her handlers, those around her. She's constantly got people around her. She says, can I go? Can I go and put the, you know, can I, can I pick up the crown? And one of them said to her, well, you're the queen. It's yours. You're the only one who can. You don't have to ask about that. The crown is yours. See, she was, she was only human. And she was new to this, being the queen. God is not human. He's not new to anything. He knows better than all of us his worth. And he rightly demands our allegiance and our total devotion. He rightly, again, demands that he, more than anything else, be our treasure. 
And so our chief end, as the Westminster Catechism says so well, our chief end, you know what you know what we live in life, Christ followers, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. To put the spotlight on Him. To, to rot- you know, have our lives rotating around Him. To be consumed with Him. To be devoted to Him. To have Him as our only treasure worthy of worship. And to enjoy Him. And that's, that's equally important, that we glorify Him and enjoy Him because delighting in our treasure makes more of Him. It compounds upon His glory. It, it, it makes more of Him and puts more glory upon Him. When I go to the hospital to visit folks or if I'm, I'm praying for somebody and they say, thank you, Pastor, and I say it was my pleasure, guess what that does? That heaps more honor on them that I say I'm doing it because I'm delighting in doing it. And so when we delight in God and honor Him in that way, it heaps even more glory toward Him, that we are enjoying Him and honoring Him and being consumed by Him, our treasure. I want you to imagine the level of fireproofing that comes to a church full of folks consumed with Christ. But instead of seeking God first and making Christ their treasure a lot of folks spend and use their lives looking to add stuff, looking to accumulate wealth. So it reminds me of another story, another, another story that happened as the fire raged. It's like a young woman who, actually, after the fire was snuffed out early that Saturday morning, a young woman, after the fire was out, was told about a mass of gold that could be hers if she found it. It was worth $1,000. In today's standards, it was worth about $20,000, this mass of gold. And so she searched and searched through the rubble and the hot bricks, and it was still smoldering. It was, it was hot. There was smoke rising from the, the bricks. The fire had just been put out moments earlier. And so she's searching and searching through the rubble and hot bricks of once a, a stately structure off of Devonshire Street in downtown Boston, and she's wanting to find this gold, and and there were heaps of hot smoldering bricks where she was to look, and that she's walking over, and she's risking, and it's a dangerous situation, and she searched, and she focused intently, all in vain, as Colonel Conwell described it. It was the only thing that mattered to her in that moment. She didn't care about the danger. She paid no attention to anything else. She paid no attention to the, 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 the many others who were devastated at their loss from the fire her mission in that moment was find the gold and from all reports she never found it and made it hers and so sadly a lot of folks spend not live they spend their lives this way focused on accumulating things often to their own detriment making life about possessions and materials and wealth and again those things are important but they're they're trivial they should be in the background the fringe compared to him, right? And so Madonna used to sing it this way in the 80s. We're living in a material world. And what did she say she was? A material girl. I'm a material. That's, that's the mantra of many even today. If you don't know Madonna, that's the mantra of many. I'm, I'm a material guy. I'm a material girl. Snoop Dogg says it this way. I've got my mind on my money and my money on my Mind. Rihanna says it this way, live your life, but keep chasing that paper, the money. Live your life and make it all about enhancing your wealth and your possessions and, 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 and you know, increase. Jesus beckons us, contrary to all of this, to make life about something altogether different, to stop chasing money, to start chasing him and his kingdom instead. So look at this, this verse on the screen, Matthew 13, 44. One simple verse that speaks volumes. Hear this. Walk out of here with this verse in your mind and in your heart. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Is like treasure. There's that word again. He wants to be our treasure, and our heart is where our treasure is. The kingdom of heaven itself. So Christ and all that his kingdom entails is like treasure that's hidden in a field Treasure, you know, supremely valuable, priceless, worth more than all else that's been hidden in the field. And so back in the day, they didn't have banks as we know them. And so many folks would, would hide things and 
you know, treasure and, and, and money and stashes in a field, and sometimes they would forget about it, or somebody would pass on and they would die, and it would long be forgotten. And so in this parable, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that you know, priceless treasure in a field which a man found, and then he covered it up, clever. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He sold everything. Nothing was comparable to the value of that treasure. And he did so joyfully, it says. Through the waiting, it wasn't instantaneous. He had to... He had to go through the struggle of selling whatever he had so he could raise the money to go out and purchase that field. Maybe things had been uncomfortable. Maybe he did away with his house and his other possessions so that he could raise that last penny to go and purchase this field because that's all that mattered to him is the invaluable, the priceless nature of that treasure that he had found in that field. And so even through the waiting and through the uncomfortable situation that he might have been in, his mind was on his acquisition of the treasure treasure that would trump it all and so he did so joyfully and that right there that one verse is how we are to view and value Christ in his kingdom so the apostle Paul said it this way indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and, 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 and count them as rubbish. He used a Greek word that means literally cow dung. I count everything else as manure comparatively to knowing Christ. He goes on to say, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. That was his singular focus. That was his mission. Philippians 3, 8 and 9 tells us all about it. Paul had it in, you know, in his heart. His, 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 you know, in his heart, his truest desire was to seek his treasure, was to, be, to know and be found in Christ. And, and that should be it for us. As, as this verse says, we should be willing to put all aside, to sell everything, to, 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 to lose everything if, if God ordains in pursuit Pursuing Christ and, and being consumed by Him above all else. Selling all that we may purchase that field and uncover the treasure of Jesus Christ and be found in Him. So if you belong to Christ, here are some warning signs that may let you know that you struggle with valuing Christ in His kingdom. We're going to end on this and pray in just a moment. Here are these warning signs that let you know you struggle with putting Christ first and making him your treasure above all else. Number one, your primary drive and motivation in life is money related. It's what dominates your thoughts. It's what dictates your actions in large part. Now, I'm not saying you don't have other things going on. You've not other got, got other fires on the furnace, but it's in large part what, what dominates your thinking. Number two, you don't give financially to the Lord at least not cheerfully, or what your heart is purpose to give, as 2 Corinthians 9-7 tells, tells us to do. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not giving unto him faithfully because you've got to have that for you and yours. That's what's on your mind and on your heart. How about this one? Three Sundays are money days. They're not worship days. They're not ministry days. They can be if there's not an opportunity for money, but for you, are they money days? You've got an opportunity to make some money, and so you're going to use it. You'll take every opportunity to, to work and to choose money before you'll go to be ministered to or to minister to others, to worship God collectively in the house of God. Are Sundays money days? How about this one? You worry and fret over the basics. You worry about food and clothes and shelter because you feel, sadly, you feel that it's up to you to make those things happen. It's why you're alive. It's, 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 it's why you're here, to, to make it, you know, pull yourself up and you have shelter, you have food, you have clothes, you have, you have money, you pay your bills. And so as 21 pilots like to sing, you're stressed out, and so you need to wake up and make the money. That's, that's why you live. If you feel that way, if you feel like you're stressed out and all you need to do is wake up every day and make the money, then you're not consumed with him. You're consumed with living your life to make the money. How about this one? Your bank account, your retirement account is what brings you comfort. Or you wish it did. You wish you had a bank account or a retirement account that brought you comfort. Or maybe it's your possessions, your home, your, 
your cars, your boats, your vacation home, your land, your clothes, your collections, your stock, your tenure at the job. We could go on and on. Do these things all somewhat money-related? Do they bring you comfort? Is that where you hang your hat? Is that what you say? At least I've got that. At least I've got tenure at the job, so I ain't going to be fired anytime soon. At least I've got that nest egg waiting for me. At least my retirement account is safe. Is that where you hang your hat? Rather than on Him. Could you carry on glorifying God and enjoying Him forever if these things I mentioned were somehow lost or destroyed permanently? Would you be able to live without just, just going ballistic and fretting? I mean, if, if your bank account or you know, any of these things I mentioned were to suddenly disappear, could you still, with joy, because you, you, don't, you don't mind selling everything to get to that, to, to, to uncover your, your priceless treasure in Christ, could you still worship Him and carry on glorifying God and enjoying Him forever if you couldn't hang your hat on any number of these financial things that we just spoke about? So here's the challenge before we go into pray in just a moment. In fact, Angela, if you'll come on up. Um, be rich toward God. There's a number of ways you can be rich, but the only one you should focus on that should consume your life is being rich toward Him, making Him your treasure. Seek His kingdom and the frills will be there in the background, number two. You've heard of John Piper and others talk about Christian hedonism, where you, can, you, 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 seek, the, you seek Christ and at the same time it benefits yourself. That is biblically true. Seek Him and everything else is taken care of in the background. He's not going to leave us begging for bread. As the scriptures say, we put him first and he takes care of us. Make Christ, number three and finally, make Christ and his kingdom your treasure and put your heart there. Put your heart in him. Put your heart and your focus and your motivation and your life's drive. Make your consummation, you're consumed with him. So if you'll bow your heads with me in prayer. You spend a moment with him and say, Christ, I'm, I'm committing to seek you first. Christ, my life will revolve around you. Commit that to him if you want that to happen. If you, if you mean that, tell him that. Christ, you're the only treasure with whom I'll be consumed and devoted. Say, Christ, you are my treasure. Thanks for reminding me about it this morning through your word that you're where it's at, that everything else, not just money, finances, and possessions, but everything else is secondary, far, far and away secondary to you. Everything else is, is worth this, is ancillary. Help me to view everything else as manure compared to you. It all smells like a, a polecat skunk compared to you. Spend a moment with him before we close. If you're far from God and his spirit is calling you to himself today, I challenge you to say yes to him today. I challenge you to call out to him, respond to him. He, he made you his treasure Inasmuch as it says God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he, he traded treasures to get you, to purchase you, to buy you back. From, he created you and, and sin robbed you from the Father. Your sin, your selfishness took you away from him and he traded treasures. He put his son on the cross to die for you, to be the penal substitute for you, to take your penalty, your, penalty, your punishment for sin. You, 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 can, you can't do anything about it on your own except for die in your sin and live a, a, an eternity apart from him. But, but Christ took the punishment for you he gave his all on the cross. And so will you turn from yourself and from your sin and place your trust in him? Will you say yes to Christ today? Will you make him your treasure? I can't wait to talk to you about that. Me and some pastors will be standing down front in just a moment. And we'd love for you to come and speak with us, pray with us and ask us questions. We'll talk more about it. God, we thank you for the challenge. 
this morning. God, I pray that you've stepped on all of our toes in some way. You've reminded us that if it's not money or wealth and you know, possessions and accumulations, that God, it's, it's, it's nothing else that we sometimes hang our hat on when it comes to comparison with, with who you are, who you should be to us, to be our treasure, to be all that we're consumed with and focused upon. Help us to look to you, to seek you first above everything else and everyone else. And God, we do thank you for the blessings that come as we do just that. We thank you that you are a good father and you take care of us. You meet our needs. You take care of the frills in the background that are far, far secondary to you. But God, when we're consumed with you, we don't fret over these things because you take care of them for us. And God, we thank you so much for that. God, I thank you for those in this room who might be hearing the call of your Holy Spirit this morning and saying yes to you and calling out to Christ as their penal substitute who died on the cross for them. May they make him their treasure as he lives with you at your right hand even now. May they put their stock in Christ and he infiltrate them and begin to make them new men, new women, new kids of God through Christ that they will forever be with you on this earth and in eternity. God, we thank you for that prospect. We love you and praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of quick announcements. We're going to be delivering some awesome goods to the, the, the community in Waverly this, later this week. Uh, uh, Randall's going to be driving his big flatbed truck with several pallets that we wrap up, and you've been faithful enough, many of you, to bring in some stuff and, and put it all over the place in, in, your, in your small group rooms. And so, number one, thanks for bringing stuff in with just a two-week notice. We've done this over two weeks, and we've got everything from batteries to shovels to mops to pillows to uh, lot, lots of lot, uh, more than 1000 I think like $1,300 were given, so we were able to buy a lot of air mattresses, some twins, some queens, some that were a little bit thicker for some folks who need the, the, the thicker mattresses to lay on and, and so it doesn't just crush their backs and, and we've, got, we've got mattress pumps and, and well, we've got so much to send to Waverly this week thanks to you. And so here's my, my challenge to you before you leave. Teachers especially, if you, if you taught a Bible study class this morning, we've got a number of our teachers out on vacation and otherwise this morning, but if you filled in for them, teachers, um, teachers, go to your class before you leave campus today and get some people in your classrooms. Josh, get some students to help you go upstairs. Bring all of your stuff, and we're going to put it over here in this hallway beside Pastor Jim's office. We'll fill that hallway. You can you know, let it encroach into Pastor Jim's office. He's not here right now, and we're going to get it out before he gets back. And so that whole, that whole corner over here, get all of the stuff from all over this campus because later on we're going to bring the trailer by and, and, and go out that door, and we'll be able to unload it easily there. Um, number two, grab a book, Boston Fire in the Church, if you haven't done so already, and read chapter two, adults. Adults, read chapter two, if you haven't done so already, by this Wednesday. Y'all, we had such stellar... Uh, small group discussion times last week. Uh, I've heard great news from every class, from every discussion group. It was, it was phenomenal. And, and so I'm looking forward to this week. This, this chapter two is, if it's not my favorite, it's one of my favorite chapters as I was writing the book uh, because it, it deals with something. That, the, the first thing that intrigued me to even look into this story and to write this book back in 2011 was when I learned that there were locked fire call boxes that existed for no purpose at all because they're locked. You can't even get into them. To, to, to ring the alarm to, to tell the authorities that a fire was was there and so why was that happening I mean this 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 chapter is going to get into that and, and challenge us in, in a number of ways according to God's word and so I challenge you to read chapter two adults and come out this Wednesday and students they started their discussion groups this morning and so they'll read chapter two those in seventh through twelfth and be ready to discuss that uh, next Sunday morning it's going to be exciting stuff you are dismissed I can't wait to see you on Wednesday thanks y'all Go grab your stuff and bring it down here to this corner, if you will. Thanks.